breath. Our scripture this morning is from the book of Job, chapter 18, verses 5 through 18. And feel free to uh, look and follow along in your Bible, otherwise it will be up here on the screen. The lamp of a wicked man is snuffed out. The flame of his fire stops burning. The light in his tent becomes dark. The lamp beside him goes out. The vigor of his step is weakened. His own schemes throw him down. His feet thrust him into a net. He wanders into its mesh. A trap seizes him by the heel. A snare holds him fast. A noose is hidden for him on the ground. A trap lies in his path. Terrors startle him on every side and dog his every step. Calamity is hungry for him. Disaster is ready for him when he falls. It eats away part of his skin. Death's firstborn devours his limbs. He is torn from the security of his tent and marched off to the king of terrors. Fire resides in his tent. Burning sulfur is scattered over his dwelling. His roots dry up below and his branches wither above. The memory of him perishes from the earth. He has no name in the land. He is driven from light into the realm of darkness and is banished from the world. Death is the king of all terrors. If anyone could escape it, they would. But no one can. Benjamin Franklin was once famously quoted, there is nothing certain in this life except death and taxes. And famous playwright George Bernard, the statistics of death are quite amazing. One out of every one person dies. <laughs> and uh, Billy Graham put it this way, death is the most democratic of all experiences. It's tragic and a fearful thing when we encounter death. The fear of death even caused one brave man to write these words. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. The author is none other than King David, the very man who killed Goliath. He spent much of his time in war with death around him. There were songs sung about him, about how he had slain tens of thousands of people. And yet even David, as we read, was gripped by fear and the horror of death. Now imagine for just a moment being out on a fishing boat. Jeff probably knows that all too well. But all of a sudden, a perfect storm comes up, and the wind blows, and it threatens to capsize your ship. How would you feel? This is what occurred in the life of the disciples. And this is how they responded. And remember, these were rugged fishermen. They said, Lord, save us. Help us from drowning. The fear of death is a purely normal human experience. But there is something to be taken, and I think we can take it away also from what Brett shared this morning. That for those who live by the flesh, death is the king of terrors. But for those who live by the spirit, it is the door to entry, or door to eternity, with God. So what can we take away from the fear of death? Because we have all experienced it at some point in time in our life. Perhaps 
in different ways, uh, perhaps uh, more than others because of life experience or life age. But the first thing is this. The fear of death is a gift that reminds us of man's sinful nature and our longing for eternity. What happens to you when your body dies? This root fear harkens back to the very beginning at the fall. It is a legitimate anxiety of the souls on earth and is based on an accurate understanding of the fact that we do find ourselves living in temporal bodies. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this is what Paul means when he says in 1 Corinthians, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Death stings so strongly. The reason that death has been referred to as the king of terrors is the sting is so strong that regardless of the immediate thing around us, we all know underneath that the root cause of this fear is because of sin. It is because of sin that death exists. There is no other explanation that holds any water as to why death exists and the universal nature of death other than sin. Our flesh cries out, doing everything it can to, to keep itself alive. Our, death doesn't, our flesh does not want to die off. That's why it screams, and that's why we fear. We even find it trying to banish it in how we speak and think. Word, the word is final, and so we've replaced it in many cases like passed on or deceased as ways to maybe kind of lighten our view of it that there is not just some finality there. Yet it is when we are willing to face the fear of death and what actually occurred at Calvary that we understand the sting has been removed by Jesus. And it's also at this time that when we think about the fear of death, we realize that our spirit cries out a hunger to return back to our Creator. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we read that the Lord formed a man from dust and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. God placed the soul, our soul, within us. And then go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, where Solomon wrote, And the Spirit will return to the God who gave it. So at death, our spirit returns back to God, while the body decays here on earth. God keeps our spirit with him until it is once again resurrected. Secondly, the fear of death helps us to reevaluate where our treasure truly lies. If you had one week left to live, what would you do with it? I used to ask that question a lot to the youth where I served before, because it's not a question that they typically consider at that stage of life. But when you stop and engage that question with sincerity, what you realize is that your value system becomes very clear. You start to uplift and value that which is of importance, and that which is not, you will remove. It's an interesting question, by the way. I would love to hear your answers to at some point, if you had a week left. And so in this moment, when we could, if we could have a set time in our mind, it would be very easy to strip away the things that we really don't value. 
And yet, too often, we talk about under, an understanding that we have an unknown amount of time that God has allotted for us on earth, and we're quick at times to further that time away. Philosophically speaking, we're asking this question. This is from, again, from the Westminster Catechism. What is the chief end, or what is the purpose of man? Is it to accumulate vast wealth and power and a great name, maybe a, a, a legacy that we can pass on to the generations that follow? Because that's what our world here encourages. And to that end, here's what Solomon had to say, and he's a bit of an expert on this. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they will have control over all of the fruit of my toil, into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This, too, is meaningless. And what I take from that is whatever purpose that we aim to live for, it is those who come after us, whether wise or foolish, who will reap the benefits or the consequences of that life. To the answer to this question in the Westminster Catechism, put much more concisely, it says this, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Those are essentially the words, almost word for word, that Brett just got done saying. We are here to give glory to God. Now, perhaps you were a little bit like me when you were young. You probably thought or lived with this mentality, maybe you didn't even think about it, but this mentality that you were going to live forever. And so you make decisions more about your pleasure and your enjoyment than might have been. However, if you have happen to have a brush with death, or you experience someone, or maybe many someone's close to you who have died, or just in general as you age, often your perspective on death changes, as well as what is important in how we spend our time, how we relate to our spouses, how we relate to our children, how we raise them and also just in general how we value and what we value in this life. It truly does bring us back to a place when we experience the fear of death of saying, what is it that truly matters? Where is my treasure in this life? Thirdly, the fear of death of the body no longer enslaves God's people. For to the believer, death is gain. A little boy and his father were out for a drive one beautiful spring afternoon. And all of a sudden, the boy frantically starts screaming because a bumblebee flew in through the window. Now the boy was deathly uh, allergic, allergic to bee stings. And so as the father drives, he hears his son's frantic cries, and he quickly reaches his hand out and snaps it shut and pulls it close. And then just like that, he releases it. As the boy calls at the grass, as soon as the bee is released and starts buzzing around again, the son begins a frantic cry. Once again, the father stretches out his hand a point in to his finger. And what he shows his son is that the stinger is in his hand. He said, I have taken the sting for you. You do not need to fear any longer. We are resistant and often fearful to change. Our flesh fights against change even when that change is minor. 
However, when we are able to see the benefit of change, we are often a little bit more receptive and less fearful of what that change can mean. Yet, how much greater is our hope when, for us as believers in what we have seen through Christ and what he has done for us? And so that even as our flesh cries out in fear, we have a greater hope for what awaits us. It is this hope where we can be present with God for eternity apart from, from sorrow and from sin that Paul could write and mean for me to live is Christ but to die is gain. You see, Paul understood that when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on, the immor puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O death, where is your victory? It is completely and absolutely normal to mourn for those that we love who have passed on. That is part of the process. They have left behind in our lives holes. And we cherish every memory that we can recall with them. And yet, Christians need not be consumed by the fear of death because Christ has reached out to us and taken the sting of death. Lastly, the fear of death of the soul has been paid for by the blood of of Christ, but it points to the necessity and urgency for believers to be conformed to Jesus. Now, if there was only one death, Christ's death on the cross was meaningless, because we all, as Christians, still experience death of the body. However, it is clear from Scripture that there is a second death. In, Revel in Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, we read, Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, it says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now Jesus here is pointing to the fact that the vast majority of the fear of death that we have is misplaced. Yes, to the flesh, bodily death is the king of terror. It's the end for the flesh. Yet Jesus says here, we are not to fear those or the thing that can kill only the body. We can look around us at all of the potential things that could do harm to us. But when we do that, when we, when we have our focus on the people or the events or the things in life that could naturally harm us, things that are a byproduct of the fall, it makes it very difficult to be able to look up towards God because we're fixated on that which is around us. And yet when we have the fear of death instilled within us, for the, the, for the one or towards the one who can kill both body and soul, it rightly focuses our minds and our life on what really matters, on God. Something that we all know and maybe sometimes overlook in our living is we only have one chance. We only have one life. There are no start overs in this life. So, 
How can we fulfill our chief end to glorify God and enjoy Him forever? What's our role in this? By recalling and testifying to what God has done in our lives and what He continues to do in our lives before other men. We need to testify to the fact that there is only one positive end to door number one. There's only one way to receive that eternal promise that God has offered to us. And it is through Christ. It is Jesus who alone has the authority over death. The presence of life, I'm sorry, the presence of death in this life demands that we consider what lies in the next life. We can attempt to ignore it, and uh, attempt to pretend as though it won't happen, pretend that we don't fear what lies before us, pretend that there is nothing that awaits us. But for the believer, we know that with Christ in us, that the fear of death does not hold the same power. Yes, you will still experience some levels of, whether it be some fear of some suffering, or, or some feelings of, what am I going to have to endure? What is the end of How am I going to die? What is it going to take before I meet the Savior? Those are normal human experiences. But it does not hold the same power. Because we know for those who live by the flesh, death is the king of terrors. But those who live by the Spirit, it is the door to eternity with God. Never forget what David, who we referenced at the beginning, who did experience some of this very fear that we referenced. Here's something else he wrote. God, he is, that he that is our God, is the God of salvation. And unto God, the Lord, belong the issues of death. We greatly glorify God when we can walk alongside or say the same thing that Job said, and that is, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. So let me close with this encouragement. And Brett alluded to this as well in his testimony. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order has passed away and the new has come. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for being a good father to us. Your love and your care for us is endless. In fact, you care more about our well-being than we possibly can, no matter how much we worry about it. And you are all-powerful, able to protect us completely and fully from anything that we might face. Lord, we confess sometimes we forget these truths. We confess we are prone to believe that we are alone and without protection. Lord, we know that this is a lie we tell ourselves, and it only works up in us more worry and fear. We repent of that fear now so that we know you have not given us a spirit of fear. Come and replace our fear with your power and your love so that we may have sound minds to live each day glorifying you completely. Help us believe and live out the truth that you are always close, always protecting, always watching over our every step. Thank you, Lord, for your great love. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand now for the benediction.
Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Blessings.